Funding for this program is brought to you by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. The Twin Ports Apita Collective came together in the wake of the Atlanta mass shootings last March. Turn to some, some tragic news, the deadly shootings in Atlanta, killing at least eight people. We felt that we had to do something about it and you know, we pulled a visual together in 24 hours. And out of that, we decided to remain together, keep building on that base of organization. And so we created the Twin Ports Apita Collective, an advocacy group for the Asian American community here in the Twin Ports area. My name is Julia Chang, and I'm the treasurer on the organizing team of the Twin Ports Apita Collective. Apita stands for Asian Pacific Islander Desi American. Desi stands for people of the South Asian diaspora, you know, the Indian continent. A suspect is in custody this morning, and police across the country are on alert this morning as well, fearing the attacks may have targeted the Asian community. Steve Osasami is in Atlanta with more as the FBI now gets involved. Good morning, Steve. That's right, Michael. The FBI is working with local law enforcement here investigating these shootings. And while it's not clear what led to these killings, it is impossible to ignore that these killings happened at Asian businesses like this one directly behind me in Atlanta and that most of the victims were Asian women. We felt we had to respond to the rise in anti-Asian hostility that was fueled by the pandemic. Words matter. Did you feel a gut punch when I just said those words? You feel a gut punch that we feel when we hear the C word, the J word, the G word. How about you feel when you hear the N word? We all felt that we'd been silent too long. It was happening too often. Um, we knew that something like that happening in San Francisco doesn't isolate us from some sort of micro or macro aggression. And uh, what we discovered when we got together and talked about it more is that we all had our own experiences, some very overt, some much more gentle in how you know they would kind of make fun of you. And it's happening to our children too. My name is Paku Lee, and I'm a Hmong American woman living here in Duluth. Uh, I've been here for over 15 years. My involvement with the Twin Ports Apita Collective uh, arised out of a need for connecting with other women who looked like me, who had similar experiences like me. And even though I've been here for a long time, it was only in the last two years that I finally uh, connected with a very small group of women who were just meeting socially. And when I discovered them, I thought, wow, it's, it's the first time I realized that I could start building a community, people of diverse Asian backgrounds coming together who happen to live in the Northland We've all been so isolated, living our own lives that um, I didn't even know that I could have this sort of connection uh, and comfort. My name is Sharon Young. Um, I've lived in Duluth for over 20 years, born and raised in Minnesota um, of two Chinese immigrants. Well, for me, naturally, food was always a, a big part of my life. My parents owned a restaurant growing up, and so, some of our happiest memories as a kid were really around the table. And um, in my family, I cannot assume for all Chinese people, in my family, food was really the language of love. And so if you could provide someone with a full belly, they knew you spent time and you knew they always left happy. And so not everyone is for potlucks for sure, but this group definitely is. And we, we, we surely enjoy a lot of time together and breaking that bread together. The group primarily started more of a, as a socializing purpose. And then it evolved. It evolved into something bigger. The organization seems like it came out of nowhere. 
but really has been building on a very strong foundation. As we continue to meet, as our group continue to grow, a couple of us have already been working in the field of, you know, just activism and supporting different initiatives. And we thought, wow, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could add some social justice aspect to our work? And that's where the discussion started about creating more of an advocacy arm to TPAC. The members of TPAC, we multiply each other's strengths. You know, we have to take some baby steps because we're so new, but a lot of it is education. A lot of it is gonna be awareness. A lot of it is gonna be us showing up, providing insight or uh, presenting to a church group, holding a candle at a vigil, and most importantly, building partnerships. Last summer, Christina was the executive director of the Duluth Art Institute, asked um, the TPAC group if we would be interested in doing an exhibit here at the depot uh, about the Asian American community. And it was a little fast and a little bit, uh, you know, maybe too soon. And we didn't have much time to organize it. She was talking about last summer in the Great Hall. And then uh, the DAI said that they had a cancellation and would we be interested in um, uh, installing an, uh, an exhibit here at the John Steffel Gallery in the balcony. And to me, that was the perfect space and the perfect timing, uh, January through March. They said they, they had a first quarter 2022 cancellation and could we fill that time? And I said, that would be great. Kind of changed my career about 12 years ago and people would ask me, how did you go from photography to taxes? And I would say, I'm still an artist, I just changed my medium. And so when I applied for this grant, it was, you know, as established regional artist, but the medium was community arts organization. Um, I had a lot of experience doing this and I, I knew that it would be important for us to create this art exhibit and, and it's been, it's just been wonderful. When I first thought about this show, I thought it would be about a sense of displacement. And you do see the pain of separation you know, of our parents who left their homes and their families of origin, the adoptees who were uprooted from their Korean culture. But as we installed the separate works, you know, works that we created individually, I felt that a greater truth and a deeper joy emerged that we have made a place for ourselves here in this community. It came through the courage of our immigrant parents. It came from the love of the families that you know, parents have for their children, children and the parents, and it came through the strong friendships that we've developed with each other. My name is Deanne Winfang, and then this is the TPAX group, Like Me, Like You piece, the signature piece, I suppose, this is part two and part one is over there at the entrance with the, with the name. So I'm simply just honored to be able to speak to these works today and to have been able to see these concepts, these ideas that we've all been talking about materialize because of this community. So we have our TPAC logo on one side as well as a logo that we designed for this exhibit which was a yin yang symbol to symbolize like me, like you. And uh, with the different pieces kind of with their spacing, it points the sense that we might seem disconnected, but together we are like each other. So even with those gaps, this makes a meaningful whole. So then the next part, part two, so this is a, uh, origami or paper folding because it's it wasn't only a Japanese origami per se but also Chinese paper folding um, that all together looks like our logo which is a, a grain of rice. A lot of the folds though, the paper folds, are from people's childhoods. I think they folded growing up. Like the open canoes 
are ones that Julie used to make when she was younger. And then the hearts and the fans, things like that are ones that I used to make growing up. And this idea of boats kind of, it matches the concept here in the sense of uh, at least a lot of the Southeast Asian immigrants, the concept of boat people. And just kind of speaks to uh, all the histories and stories. Like my dad came here on a boat after the Vietnam War, but also the idea of floating, being part of a larger sea, a larger ocean. These are my parents. My mother is watching my father being cared for by nurses at the Hillcrest Hospital after he had a stroke and he never really recovered from that. Um, this is the first time that I've shown these images in public. When I did these photos, I was kind of at the height of my maturity as a photojournalist. I, I had to emotionally disengage a little bit to do these photos, but as painful as it, as it is to look at them 20 years later almost, um, I'm, I'm glad that I recorded it. This is a father and daughter that I photographed in Fitchburg, Massachusetts. Um, uh, they are rehearsing Laotian traditional dance. I am really grateful for the friendship that I have developed with my TPAC sisters. And it's one of the reasons that I know that we've made homes for ourselves here and that we continue to contribute to the fabric that is America. We are dealing with trauma of racism our tools for resisting the heightened anti-Asian hostility of the pandemic era are speaking our truth out loud and standing with our BIPOC sisters and brothers. Our collaboration, which is lifting each other up along this 10 month journey of putting the show together is what brings cohesion to the individual works of this exhibit. This show is more than we ever imagined it could be, and we are also grateful and honored to make this gift to our community. You know, as we were talking about the intent of it, um, what, could, what components could be part of the exhibit, um, it really came down to showing the community that we have similarities, we are interconnected uh, in many ways that we're not aware of, I am like me, but in many ways, I'm also like you. Like me, like you is sharing traditions, sharing the beauty of culture. It's also sharing, um, you know, sadness, which is something we all experience uh, in different points of our life. Um, and, and holding what's, you know, the most treasured traditions, that's really, something that I think everyone can relate to. And that's something that we're trying to show is that we are multi-ethnic as well. So, you know, we come from all, all around the globe, but we're here in the Twin Ports and we're choosing to be here. We're choosing to, to work here, to live here, to raise our children here, to invest here. My piece is a uh, diptych which is a collaboration that I did with my dear friend, Julia Chang, and so grateful for her artistry and direction. So on the left-hand side is one of the first pictures that my mother, my adoptive mother received when I was in the orphanage. And then on the other side is a current picture of me with a longer bang, um, just to let you know. It's hard to believe that my story is actually being told in public because it's been such a private journey for myself. My journey starts as an involuntary immigrant. My beginning in the history is actually unknown. Um, for the first three years of my life, it's hard to think about not knowing or remembering what happened during that time. And so as if my life started when I was adopted not knowing the real truth as well about that piece of my life is, um, is something that I've had to accept over time.
being surrounded with the other artists and the TPAC members and allies has contributed to finally making my story my own. It's really contributed to my own healing. It's also a story that I want to share. And this was also a motivation why I decided to do that is to, I wanted to make sure that other Korean and transracial adoptees would know that they are not alone. We'd share stories after dinner, right? In these social potlucks. And sometimes you wish that other people could just be a fly on the wall and listen. And so I think I just really wanted the rest of the world to listen to stories that people are willing to share and understand that we're probably more alike than different. I wanted all the kids to take my wife's baby. That's my hope, is really when people listen to the podcast, they might find elements that are completely different from their upbringing, but when you come to the end of it, you realize, I have more in common with that person than not. And that, that really was my intent. So um, this is just a compilation of people in the community, all different types of APITA people. I completely ignored it because that wasn't my name. So I'll respect and openness and welcoming of all cultures that Julie really tells her story, and without giving it away, in just a few minutes, just by her voice, you really can feel all the emotions that she went through it as a child and as she comes of age and then into an adult. All I know is the adult version, but all the things that happened to her made her what she is. I was adopted at the age of three, and so I landed in the United States in 1971. Back then, there was nobody that looked like me. I don't even know if I had an identity. Back then, people didn't like people that looked like me. I always talk about my childhood as brutal because it was, um, you know, just being different, standing out, being called names. And so my memories of my childhood are actually, I don't have many at all. You know, I think that's common with people who've experienced trauma. So when we talk about violence and hate, um, what happened to my parents when they first came here and their experiences of racism happened to me as well into adulthood. Um, and now it's happening to my children. So you talk about intergenerational trauma. That's the example of how trauma carries over because we haven't changed how we think about other people. We think about other people as others, as foreigners, or as people who don't belong. And so that racism perpetuates. And so somewhere along the way, we have to stop we have to do better. We have to teach our children better. We have to, you know, use our humanity, our intelligence to really learn from each other so that we can stop this harm and stop the trauma. Because we, we see the violence, we see the death that comes out of this and that's not the kind of world I want to live in. It's not the kind of world I want my children to live in. We don't want to be invisible. Um, we contribute a lot to this community through uh, our employment, our civic uh, participation, our volunteer work. You know, our children go to school here. We really want to contribute to this community. I was adopted when I was a baby, and I've lived in Duluth ever since. Um, I started my jewelry business about a year ago, and I named it Soul and Stone. Soul for my birthplace, and Stone, the name of my son, and also because I use stones in my jewelry. The three pieces that I have in the show are copper electroformed, which is a process of fusing copper onto um, another medium. It really got me thinking about my identity and the feelings that I have around being Asian and being adopted 
And it's taken a lot of courage to open up and be vulnerable. Um, but thankfully now I have this, uh, this web of other people and artists that have similar experiences and stories. Um, and I'm just so grateful to be in this show. Dahi Kim and Matthew Kashmir, they weren't able to be with us, but they also have a film called The Big Happiness that's also part of the exhibit. Dahi on the left is talking with another Krang adoptee when, they, when she was in Korea, and the picture on the right is dinner table conversation with her adoptive parents. So many of her experiences were familiar to mine when I watched the film last summer. And it highlights Dahi's personal exploration of adoption, identity, and colorblindness growing up in a transracial family. My name is Aya Kawaguchi. I was born in Japan and moved to Duluth in 2005 because of my husband's job. So I have been producing mainly paintings and drawings, and my works are based on the idea of updating the landscape or scenery. So in Japanese dictionary, the simple definition of the word uh, landscape also includes both physical scene as well as psychological integration with harmonious nature. So in this exhibition, uh, you can see four watercolor paintings and two glass paintings. Most images are from uh, the nature in Duluth when I hiked at the nature center or some other places. And at these places, I take pictures uh, kind of randomly and then try to transform an original photograph into a more personal and meaningful state. But I want to explain why this was really important to me. My mother, who, who immigrated from China and Hong Kong, she grew up in Hong Kong. She, as an older adult, traveled to China by herself. She went back as an adult, as a tourist. And she brought back this, this cross-stitch pattern um, with the beads. She said, well, I, I want you to just do something with it. And she gave it to me. It took me almost three years to finish this. Um, one, it's, it's, it's almost more challenging to do because it's one color and it's very monotonous. But I realized every time, every bead, every bead that I sewed on, I thought of her. I thought about her experience. I thought about her when she was a child. She was working sweatshops. She did this to get out of poverty. She, that's how she became a seamstress. She was so poor as a child laborer. And here she travels back and brings me back this simple embroidery. And so I had to finish it. I had to complete it. I had it custom framed and I gave it back to her. And this is traditionally hanging on her mantle. And I feel like I could at least do this for my mother. And so she has really given me the, the, the gift of great fortune, which is what really this means. So I wanted to share this with everybody. That outfit was made by my mother uh, when I was a teenager. And the goal was that, you know, she wanted to make something for me from her hands instead of being store-bought. It was meant to be a gift for when I moved away from the house and got married and something that I treasure and uh, will always have with me. I think that that trauma of losing your country, giving everything up to hopefully find a better life, you know, that, that stays with you because you feel like you're losing a part of your soul, part of your spirit. Um, behind and I see that a lot especially in the elders who grew up there it's the only home they ever knew it's the only language they spoke and then to be thrust into a completely different environment with a completely new language more technology than they're ever used to I think that trauma always stays with you uh, some people are able to be resilient and find a way to adapt to American culture. Um, others are not, and you can see it. You can see it in them because um, it's very hard for them to adjust to the traffic, the noise, the, the people, the language. Um, they don't know how they fit in. And I think that's a, that's a really hard way to live. If you don't know where you really fit in, and you've got people who are transitioning and transforming around you, but yet you are kind of stuck 
in the same place. It's, it's as an elder, um, it's very hard. Really learning about the history, understanding what really happened, it helps me heal a little bit more. But if you if you don't really understand, then how can you heal? You know, for me, it really is about finding that truth. For me, most of them, my memories are here in the United States, being told you're going to go to church and then you're going to go to preschool and then you're going to go to Sunday school, um, having no clue what it was that I was doing or learning, um, no clue what I was eating, but I, I was told I had to do it, so I did it. Um, and my parents were told, you know, you should go to church, and so they went to church. I think many Hmong people felt more free in their country. Even though they were a minority group, they felt they could live uh, a much freer life. I know even my parents who are uh, approaching 80, they always talk about, you know, the home country with this longing of wanting to return, of the way things were, of some, you know, simplicity of life, of just not having to explain themselves, of just feeling like they belonged somewhere.